Hey, welcome back to another episode of the Mindshare Podcast. This show is sponsored by Kits Keep In Touch Systems, a two-time international award-winning marketing suite for sales professionals. REM, Real Estate Magazine, Canada's premier monthly magazine for real estate professionals. And the ORCF, the Ontario Realtors Care Foundation, enabling and empowering realtors across Ontario to fundraise in support of shelter-related causes in the communities in which they live and work. You can learn more about all of our sponsors by visiting my site, mindshare101.com. And hey, while you're there, be sure to download your free copy of the Ultimate Marketing Bundle so you can build more Mindshare to get more market share. Plus, of course, learn more about our one-to-one coaching and keynote speaking. Today's episode is number 302. He's a respected authority in the real estate industry with a deep passion for helping others thrive. With plus 40 years of hands-on experience and a track record of success, he's not just a coach, but a dedicated mentor committed to the growth and success of every client. Known for blending strategic expertise with genuine compassion, he strives to empower real estate professionals to build profitable, sustainable businesses. As a client's biggest cheerleader and fan, He provides unwavering support and guidance, ensuring each client reaches their full potential, both personally and professionally. Joining me on this episode of the Mindshare Podcast is Coach Ron James. Ron, welcome to the Mindshare Podcast. Hey, thanks, brother. Thanks for having me here. This is, you know, it's interesting. You're like the Joe Rogan of real estate podcasts. (laughs) In the green room, they actually have M and M's back there. It's awesome. Oh, dude! You know what? I I, I would love, I would love at some point to be able to go as wild and wacky as what Joe does, and like yeah. carte blanche. Nobody says anything because you're just too big. Yeah. Well, that's cool. the thing. You, you know, you you've you've landed at this point. You've 302 episodes of bringing kind of wisdom and marvel to the real estate world and. And to the folks that serve that industry at this point, so uh, yeah, very very happy to be here, brother. Thank you. Well, we're we're excited, my friend. And uh, as you know, again for everybody, we got uh, Ron James, coach uh, in this industry. That uh, alongside, uh, we've known each other a number of years. And and you know, my my thought today was we were going to talk about uh, maximizing success and how real estate agents can reach their full potential in a changing market. Um, and there's a you know, it's it's kind of a high level title that says we can really talk about anything today. But, you know, my thoughts here are, and for everybody tuned in, you know, we want to talk about some of the, the, you know, the insights and the expertise within the industry and and get into some of the trends and maybe some of the tech that people are using. Um, As we talk about trends in tech, I definitely want to talk about real world strategies, what actually works. Um, And of course, mindset, mindset's a big one to, to achieving anything we want in life. Um, and then we'll, we'll we'll take a quick glance into what we believe maybe the future holds for the industry. Because again, this one this one's awesome. You know, having you here, I know you've been in the industry a number of years, helping people just the exact same way we are here with Mindshare One Hundred and One, really trying to make the industry a better place and doing it essentially one person at a time. Um, so I, I'm I am confident that the the insights that you've got and that we're going to be able to share here today are going to be super valuable for everybody involved. And so you know, I thought maybe we we'd, we'd kind of start and. I hate going backwards in time too far because if you go like three, four years back, nobody really wants to go back there. Uh, but I would ask you, Ron, you know, what shifts have you noticed in how realtors are approaching their business over these past few years? What's what's really changed in the way they're doing things? Uh, market shift. You know, we talked about mind share. How about market shift? So the situation with this is, if you're an active realtor right now with active listings, when was the last time you, you had a listing that took more than 30 days to sell? Right. 50 days, 90 days, right? Uh, 180 days. You know, have you ever experienced something that took six months to sell? And if the answer is no, you need to find better answers. <laughs> How would you suggest people are doing that? Uh, there's a whole bunch of, I mean, you got to look at the average age of a realtor on the Toronto Real Estate Board is a 54 year old woman. Okay. Right. The average age of a team leader is a 32 year old male. Mm. Right. So what can you, we learn from that? You got, you got to go find the old industry Yodas like me at this point to kind of go, hey, man, when we didn't put a sign up and it sold in three days, what did you do? It, right. It's true. Eh? I was just I was I was uh, I was at an event yesterday. That I spoke at a great group of people. Um <clears throat> 
we talked about that. You know, the difference between going home in 30, 60, 90 seconds and what people believe the market is today around, you know, a 30, 60, 90 days on market. And I know, I know there are people out there that are sitting much longer than that at this point. Yeah. You know, it's just reported that uh, we've got the highest amount of listings on market since June of 2010. We've surpassed 25,000 listings at this point. Yep. It's sitting around. So, you know, and it's interesting because if you look at people's, uh, a lot of folks really don't know uh, how to gauge what's a seller's market, what's a balance market, what's a buyer's market. Mm -hmm. uh, my understanding is, is that the, it's an inventory uh, solution. So if you have four months of inventory or three months of inventory or less at this point, I believe the number is four, four months of inventory or less where we are in a seller's market. If we're four to six months in a market, we're in a balanced market. If we're plus six months worth of inventory, we're in a buyer's market. So I still think we're probably sitting in that four to six months worth of inventory. So we're probably in a very balanced market. What does that mean to a realtor? Nobody's selling and nobody's buying. Like right. they're standing there kind of going, no, you move, no, you move. So it does require more skill, more talent, and certainly more expertise from the realtor today because they just don't know how to move the market. No, and you know what? I, th I think that that uh, like one thing that we've been sharing with people, and I'm curious to know what you, what you're sharing with your people. One one of the messages I'm delivering to people right now is very much about communication, right? Communicate to educate. Yeah. Make sure that you've got an open line of communication with your buyers. Make sure you got an open line of communication with your sellers. Be incredibly transparent. You know, even off the onset of the entire relationship, set expectations. You well, know, and that's something that that we do with our clients regularly. Like, what 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 what, what can you expect from me? What can I expect from you? And what should we expect from the journey? Or in this case, to, to to our audience today, what can we tell our clients they are going to expect from the market and right. this entire process of moving, transacting? I, I agree. However, agents don't know what you're talking about, right? They, they haven't had to have a 30-day script, a 60-day script, a 90-day script. They've never had one. They've, they've never spoken to somebody that needed one. So in the follow-up, when I have nothing interesting to say, there's been no showings. At this point, we all both know that it's going to be a price change. Nobody wants to have a conversation. So we become a big bunch of frady cats about talking to our people. And partially because we have no idea what to say. What are we going to update them on? Hey, guess what? If you didn't notice already, we've had no showing since the last time we've talked. Nobody's excited about that conversation. But they also didn't plan to have that conversation either. They didn't set those expectations up in their onboarding, whether it was with a buyer or whether it was with a seller. So what happens is when they have nothing to say, they say nothing. And then what does the consumer see, right? The fact that I never hear from my agent, mm -hmm. you know, and it's interesting, uh, David, I'll just throw on the table. You and I, you know, both understand this situation. If I take a listing, typically within a week or two weeks, I'm going to have a revisit with my seller. I'm going to sit down and talk about the showings. We're going to talk a little bit more mm -hmm. about you know, what's happening with our marketing and our competition, et cetera, et cetera. When do you do that with your buyer? When do you sit down and sit down and have a strategy meeting with the buyer? It's like, oh, I see them every weekend. Yeah, showing houses. That's different than a strategy mm -hmm. meeting. You're not sitting down, going through, reviewing what you've seen, what your qualifications are. Is your pre-approval still active at this point in time? When does it run out? What does that mean to you? Is there something better? Do we need to kind of change anything? Because things have changed in our search. We continue to look and the market continues to shift. Are we market ready? We don't have that conversation. And I'm surprised because- Why I'm, don't we have that conversation? Is it out of fear of, of losing somebody? Well, Pushing them away, well, being too pushy? Nobody's ever shown them to have it. Like I have a strategy. I have 10 slides that I go through with a buyer every seven to 10 days, the slides are the same. The story's different. When I talk to the, these are just markers to kind of go, here's where we are, here's where we are, here's where we are at this point. And then it's updated as to what's happened. Here's what we've seen. Here's what's sold since we looked at it. This is the one that you said, ah, maybe it's sold, but it's sold for $40,000 more than you were prepared to pay. Would you have paid that? Well, that's where the market is now redirecting. So that buyer, if you look at it, I make as much money selling that buyer as I do with a with a seller. With the seller, I'm all over them like a fat kid on a smarty. I'm giving them information, giving them information, giving them information. With my buyer, I'm going, you want to go see more houses? Want to go kick more tires? No. We need a strategy meeting with your buyer. Yeah, and I, I would add on to that, I, and I agree with you completely. I, I, I do believe that, one, there's a lack of education here for a big part of our audience who's never been in that situation to have to force that conversation. I also believe, and you mentioned about being scared, 
we got to get past the fear of being too pushy or past the fear of wanting to guide people properly. And I believe that that's a big part of what we do is we're here to guide. We're here to provide advice. We're here to provide, hey, I've done this before. I'm going to keep you safe and show you how to do it properly so that you ultimately achieve what you want. Well, I, and this really comes in, you know, we talked a little bit about tech, right? When I get a listing that comes in off of realtor.ca or some kind of lead AI that I've got kind of running at this point in time, when did you have the buyer on board? Oh, I had a conversation with them. Really? Did right. you have a proper onboard? Does the client have a full set of expectations of what's going to happen? What's beginning, middle, and an end? How do we go from this conversation to congratulations, here's your keys? Mm -hmm. Do you have a formal presentation on this point? Or are you meeting Bob, Bob, at the property for the first time at this I point? call Bob Judy. Like, you know what I mean? Like, there's always like Bob or Judy. I get you. Yeah. <laughs> so I see a lot of people shaking hands at the fr <laughs> at the driveway at this point, meeting for the first time. And that scares the hell out of me because it's like, how do I know that your buyer is properly qualified? How do I right. know you're qualified? Yeah, but I, I'm worried though. Like I, I, I'm scared that if I go and have that conversation, they might just go work with another agent. Well, they might. Well, be better. You know, you know, do I have to be better? No. But do I have to be different? Yep. And again, it's all about points of value, right? Uh, yeah, I, you know, I had a client that, you know, was with a company that supplies leads, man, this person ended up with like a database of like 160 leads in the first 30 days they were with this company, 160 leads. And here's the cool part. More than half of those people very willing and able to kind of come out and look at houses with you, not to buy them. So they're happy to kind of have you <laughs> The door. Listen, if you get me started in this whole lead thing, all right, we're, we're going to go down like a rabbit hole here today, Ron, because I, I tell you now, like, don't get me wrong, there's ways to generate opportunity. I, I do believe that and there are people shopping. Um, but, you know, just on the topic of like these lead companies, uh, where are they getting all the leads from? Because we know when most people are getting out there and doing their prospecting, they can't find these people. So just, you know, magically, when you spend a whole bunch of money, here you yeah. go, here you go, here you go. Uh, there is a major, major lawsuit going on with NAR right now down in the States that, uh, you know, talks to the fact that 50 to 60 percent of those have not been vetted. Um, and they're actually, you know, calling a lot of BS on that stuff. Now, again, I digress because I could go down a whole rabbit hole on the conversational leads. Um, that being said, though, the proper qualification, sticking to the point we're making there, the proper qualification, the conversation is an, an imperative. You know, we always advise people, you get into that conversation and somebody starts asking you about potentially like, how's the market? And, you know, this, uh, ask the open-ended questions, dig, use yeah. some active listening as a strategy, truly understand and try to dig into why is somebody asking me this question right now? And if we can understand why somebody's asking the question right now, what we can then do at that point is get a better sense of, are they serious? Do they truly want to do this? And from there, the next two questions really become around, you know, what's the motive? And then what are the timelines? Now yeah. you've got all the other things. And like you say, with the slide presentation that you do, or, or some of the, you know, the prequal questions we have to ask about financing, et cetera. There's a lot of that stuff as well that needs to come up. Oh, a lot sure. of people are scared to ask those questions at fear of pushing people away. But I do believe that if you're scared to ask those questions, you're going to spin your tires in the mud. You're going to be spending a lot of time, probably not getting to where you want to get to. You're going to get frustrated. Your mindset's going to get down. And then you're going to look and say, it's all, it all, none of it works. I got to, I got to go spend money to find a solution for something. And we know, and I said this to somebody earlier today, com, uh, money is not the solution to complacency. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I look at, um, people haven't been shown how to do this. There's been no guidance and leadership, right? And people say, oh, I love my brokerage. Excellent, right? Is the broker showing you things like how to show a house, right? How to have a buyer plan. I, I don't use the word presentation. It sounds like pitch. I don't pitch people. I show them the plan. Everybody loves a guy with a plan, a man with a plan. So I have seller plans, which used to be called seller listing presentations. I have buyer plans, which used to be called buyer uh, onboarding, you know, presentations, but you need it. It's how you establish value. Who's going to sign, you know, this is one of the challenges with NAR is they have no idea how to pitch their value to get somebody to sign a contract to work with them. I, I have one that's bulletproof. I have one that's got sure fire. You're going to have the client begging you to sign your document, your BRA mm -hmm. at the time of your buyer presentation or plan, as I call it. At the time, then they'll say, well, can I do it now? Can I sign with you right now? Yep. And the reason why they say that is because I established value. 
I, not once, yep. not twice, but three times in probably less than 45 minutes, they understood why they need to work with me and only me to help them in the guided tour of home buying. So if we look at the, you know, the way our industry is evolving um, and look at the client relationship, I believe truly it's very much about the transparency. It's very much about get rid of the fear of if they don't want to work with you, instead provide the proper guidance, the proper plan, and you should be successful. Yeah. And if you have to expedite it, I mean, there's some black belt level stuff. Like, you know, if if you phoned me, David, and said, hey, uh, you know, it's realtor.ca lead, right? You have a listing at 123 Any Street. My answer is this. You want to see it? When do you want to see it? Yeah. And other people would say, oh, no, I want to invite them into the office and I want to do this, et cetera. And it's like, yeah, absolutely. If that's your go-to and you, you're very good and can man that, great, terrific, do that. For me, I'm pretty good on my feet. So the situation is, is I'll meet you at the door. But right. I'll tell you something. I'll happy, uh, you know, happy to walk you through the property at this point, make sure that this is the right thing for you at that point. I know for the most part that it won't be. You're not buying this house, but you might buy in this neighborhood. But now we got the opportunity to meet. Right. And then, then I can go into my, you know, my shtick, what I say. Yeah. Right? Okay. Some feedback on a scale of one to 10. And I, I don't understand this. This is recently people saying, you know, on a scale of one to 10, but you can't use seven. Why the hell not? Seven's my number. Here's why. If it's a six, right? That's not even on a list. That's a polite way of saying pass. Seven hmm, might be a list, might be a question mark to the list. At eight, we're writing paper. Right. So like it, like it. Time, when you hear somebody say, you know, scale of one to 10, you know, you can't use seven. Yeah, you can give it a seven just because they said <laughs> they say the two most picked numbers on the scale of one to 10 are three and seven. Well, there you go. Right. So, um, OK, so so looking at that now, now, now shifting to some of the trends that are, that are out there right now, because, again, I. I Man, we see the roller coaster of ideas coming to this industry every, you know, three, four years, and everybody jumps on the bandwagon and they're going to change their world and they're going to drive more business. And then all of a sudden they tried it, they spent a lot of money at it, they didn't truly understand it, it didn't really work. And now they go searching for the next one. What are you seeing right now with some of those more, more, and I don't want to use the word most, but more impactful trends um, that are working specific to, you know, even when we talk to marketing right now in terms of marketing our business in this business? Yeah. First, my my uh, my uh, instant answer is learn how to sell real estate, kids. Like, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I, I said looking to people who order take from their buyers and sellers. I just, I, I just listen, everybody, everybody tuned right now, uh, tuned in. This is Ron James. He's a coach in the industry, and of course, you can tell just by his answer right there. There's a reason why he is on the Mindshare podcast today. Uh, sorry, <laughs> keep going, pal. Yeah. <laughs> Learn to sell real estate. You kind of have to understand, you know, that buying cycle that drive, and there really is a buying cycle, right? There's a sales cycle, and do you know it? Is there a buying cycle, and do you know it? Can you communicate it to how the steps are? How do you know where you are with your buyer? If you're still looking at 40, 50 houses, right? Guess who's in control? The buyer's wigging you by the nose, man. Hey, how about these 10? How about another 10? How about another 10? Guess what? You're, you're an Uber driver. At least they get paid. Yeah, yeah. You're for free. Maybe you stop and get them pizza too, so you could do Uber Eats and. <laughs> but you're not being a realtor, by the way. Okay, so so here, uh, and I'm with you. Don't be an order taker. I yeah. like I always compare the hunter and the order taker. The order taker sitting there, like literally that, waiting for somebody to order the pizza, and you make the pizza, you deliver the pizza, see you later. Okay, wait for the next one. Uh, okay. Whereas we, you know, we coin the term with a hunter, get out there and hunt, set yeah. your traps, catch your food, and then before you eat that food, go set more traps and now you're always hunting which obviously means you're nurturing your clients and you're out there prospecting and it's like oh yeah i'm working on this listing and you go well i understand you're working on listing what about the next listing well i don't have time for that well let's talk about your you know how you're working with time then because it seems like you haven't got the proper structure there yeah. um most looking at that though sorry most don't no most no no of, it's a common running theme about the calendar um you know David, my very first day in real estate, March 10th, 1982, in our office meeting, our, our broker of record, Vernon Jobity, I think he's still around, actually. Uh, hey, man, he was he was the guy that gave me a break. He was the guy that tolerated Ron James. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> he was, he was Kudos to that guy, eh? 
you know, he had his hand up and I'm trying to pull my hand back so I can show you. So, uh, you know, he had it and he said, here you are working on this buyer or seller at this point in time. Do you realize that they're on the vine are four more deals? Like if you did this really well and really right, right, there's four more deals that follow what you did here. Right. And the only thing that you concentrate on. I like that. Why aren't you going for the whole cluster, the whole hand, the whole vine with the five deals as opposed to focusing on one? And that, guys, that's a 43-year-old legacy statement that this man made that still resonates with me every day. I still use it in my own kind of coaching and teaching because they leave all of the good stuff on the ground. You focused on one. Great. You so you sold it. Excellent. Nice listing. Up three days later, gone. Now you're unemployed again. What do you got? What are we working on? What's in the hopper? Nothing. Nothing. What do you so, suggest people do as non-negotiables in a day then? Well, I mean, uh, you got to look at where the nest is, right? If <laughs> I don't like to work with bikers. Why not? They're cash buyers. And if I sell one, I sell them all, right? You have to kind of look at the situation of where's the nest, right? How effective can I be? I have somebody that uh, recently was talking about a new listing in a building that they're not necessarily partial to. Right. They don't like the building. They don't like the clientele in the building, but they're getting a listing in this building. And I'm like, you need to be the authority. They're like, I don't want another listing in this building at this point. I'm like, why not? There's 200 other addresses. If you did a really, really good job the first time, all of your marketing, all of your awareness marketing, all of this, you got it done when nobody else could was for one unit. You left so much of your ROI on the table, all of your marketing, all of the kind of push that you did for this particular building, drawing attention to yourself as a, an authority on the building and the property itself whew, disappeared. Did you spend any money for marketing? Good. Guess what? That's a stone. I could have taken $3,000 worth of staging on one unit, leveraged it across three more listings. Use this listing to get that listing, to get that listing, to get that listing. Got to stack them and rack them, boys. Buddy, it's, hey, listen, get out there and talk to people. This is what we keep talking to. So now as we talk, you know, we, we, we've talked about talking to people. We now look and say, you know, roll up your sleeves and go and show people what you're up to and have that plan. Talk to me. What do you think about this whole thing with AI? Like, you know, how is it reshaping the way agents are thinking about what they can do with it? What agents are actually doing with it? How they're conducting business with it? I mean, what's your whole take on the AI, you know, the whole AI roller coaster right now? Well, uh, let's put it this way. I'm ha I'm happy to be at the other end of 43 years because I don't know what the AI is going to look like. Now, do I use it? Am I a huge fan of ChatGPT? 100%. I use it a ton. I highly recommend it for so many uses at this point that really are a time saving at that point. However, I've also seen people that have become so automated. I have a client uh, recently that that um, they have a phenomenal onboarding listing. It's, it is slick and they've got lots of personnel and everybody understands the process and they look slicker than cat shit putting it all together. Mm -hmm. Except they got an email from the prospective seller who is an older woman at this point that backed away and said, you guys spooked the shit out of me. Mm. At this point, you guys were so automated, so robotic in your process. And I know I said yes to it all. But when I actually saw it in motion and happening, it overwhelmed me and shut me down. So I'm going to put all of this on the back burner until a later date. And so I get a panic call from the client going, well, ah, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? We apologize. This woman just taught you a lesson and you thank her because, you know, you guys are so slick at everything that you do and it runs like clockwork. But you never ask the client how they're really doing emotionally. The most important part was how are you feeling? Well, last. There's what AI doesn't do. Right. It hasn't got the emotion to it. Uh, it can build me systems. It can yep. build me checklists. It can show me exactly step by step what I need to do every single day. But eventually, I have to have some kind of acuity to kind of go, where's my client at? Where's your head? You know what? We, uh, we, so. Last week, we did the Mindshare Mastermind. We had a fantastic event, uh, amazing people, amazing topics, just the conversation, the collaboration. It was, it was second to none. Um, we touched on the topic, and I brought in some experts to talk about AI. Some guys that are are like, you know, the tech nerds. Like, And I say that with dude love and respect. He's just, just fantastic with the stuff. And one of the big takeaways we had there was, and again, a lot of great conversation around ChatGPT. 
uh, how to help you with content ideas, you know, brainstorming. The big takeaway, Ron, was was use AI as your co-pilot. You still got to be the pilot. Well, right? I, if everybody understands that analogy, right? You still got to fly the plane. I, I use a, a Marvel uh, reference, right? Uh, Tony Stark runs Jarvis. Jarvis doesn't run Tony Stark. Okay. Right. And, and, and this is it, though, because Blockbuster, travel agents, taxi cabs, think about it. I got into an Uber the other day after I got off, you know, I got out of the Leaf game. And I mean, I said hi because I'm a polite guy. But outside of that, I didn't have to say where I was going. I didn't have to pull out a credit card and pay. I didn't have to do anything. Everything was done by the app. So the automation now, which is very slick, when we talk about our industry and we talk about remaining relevant and we look at the way people are, well, not so favorable to our industry for, you know, any given reason, the more we automate, the more we disconnect, the more we disconnect, the less relevant we are, the less we're needed. Now people start to find alternative solutions. So I think that there's some advantages to leveraging the technology, leveraging the AI specifically. Again, from a content perspective, I think it could be a fantastic co-pilot. I don't think it's the right thing that should be scheduling your days. Yes, there's a you know there's AI to help you schedule. Well, I don't want the robot telling me where I got to go and when. It doesn't think the way I do. It doesn't feel the way I do. The emotions aren't there. Yeah. Could I and use it to help me again get more creative on content? Sure. Could I use it to help me with some automation of my processes that might be more internal for me, such as maybe uploading data to a CRM? Sure. I would go the distance and say to everybody, though, if you really think about the simplicities of sending out a QR code on some piece of marketing collateral, which connects back to a landing page, which then has an API that's going to take it right into your database, you've already kind of got that going. Yeah. Unless you're over 65 and you don't know what a QR code is. Okay. You know, well, interesting. fair, fair. That client basically uh, has a, a niche in their business that serves the seniors market. And they have a bunch of resources in that seniors market, uh, including somebody with a publication. And they just bought some ad space in there and they're going to be contributing some art articles, et cetera. So in speaking with the people behind the media, the magazine, they basically said, there's no place in our magazine for QR codes or email addresses or websites you own will only allow you to put a phone number because these clients phone so if you right. can't answer the call right you can't advertise in our magazine and you kind of look at that and go wow they really know their audience that well at this point that they're dictating the levels of communication you know that was another uh great that you brought that up um that was another big talking point around the ai was to understand who your avatar is yeah. Right. Who is your client avatar? Who are the people you're dealing with? And, and, and I, I get it too. Like, man, <laughs> that? that's like sales one on one. If you don't well, know who your audience is, who's your audience? Well, this is the so, thing. okay, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny. Uh, everybody knows the song "Brown Eyed Girl," but you know what? I like country and western music. Can you play that song, "Brown Eyed Girl," with a country western vibe, feel, pace, cadence? At this point, can you do it reggae? Can you do it? You know, hip hop. You know, can you do it uh, like P Diddy? Oh, sorry. No, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I I, uh, I had somebody who who, and this was this was probably a few years ago. He tells me that his entire strategy is actually to go after the seniors. Okay, great. What are we going to do to go after them? He says, "Well, I want to implement this new social media strategy." And I thought to him, I said, "You know, yeah, we're <laughs> we got to talk this one out a little bit more right now because based on who your avatar is, we better make sure that these." people are going to be where you think they are going to be, yeah. which I didn't agree that they'd necessarily be there. Not to say that nobody is, but again, this is, this goes back to, you know, from a technology perspective, from a marketing perspective, you know, what, who is the avatar? What are we using? Um, and on this specific topic around, you know, my question to you about AI and, and, and the way it's reshaping the industry, I guess my big message to people is, you know, don't, don't lose sight of, of what our job is in this business to help people, to help people buy and sell, you know, to market properties, negotiate deals. It's not there to automate and take ourselves out of the equation. We do that and we are going to go away. Well, you know, we look at some of the old school techniques and people say, well, there's no room for old school. All right, cool. Um, 
if I put a room full of realtors, today's realtors in a room and decided to teach them how to kind of negotiate an offer across the table, like we did once upon a time, yeah. Right? I'm going to tell you a whole bunch of them are going to fail. Even the big guys can't do it. You know, that's an art that's been lost. Yep. Well, I was going to ask you about that, like outdated practices um, that you think agents should move away from. Is there anything you think they should move away from? And in, in that same breath, because you just brought it up, because it'd be, I think it'd be an amazing thing if people could actually go and present offers again. Yeah. Is there anything that one, you think people should move away from? And, and I'll double down and say anything that we maybe should embrace more. Yeah, I, I think we should do away with all kind of uh, uh, extra education, like RICO updates and things like that, and just force real estate agents to sell their own home every year, every year. If only if to make them an empath to what it's like to sell your house and what it's like to buy one. Like you're not in the client's shoes enough at this point to understand, you know, their their hesitations, their fears, their understanding of, you know, the fact that, they don't know the market. They don't know how to play the game. And as you know, David, real estate's like milk. Things are only good for 30 days. If if you bought a house 10 years ago, there's already been 120 changes mm -hmm. to the real estate industry in the last 10 years that since you bought. So yeah, you were a wizard 10 years ago. Now there's been 120 changes. Right. Do you want me to start going but, further? But 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 changes within like the, you know, again, what what the the regulatory stuff, but I mean, has the game of like what we're doing really changed? Things that we do that we don't, you know, that we didn't, I'll tell you, interesting. Uh, 16 years ago, I did a television show where we were talking about the home inspection process. So we took it all apart and did yep. the roof, the furnace, etc. When we got to the electrical side, right, my home inspector, that was my co-host on that particular TV show, right? He said, listen, you can't run the cameras as I take the plate of the uh, front panel of the um, hydro panel off. I'm like, why not? He said, we're not allowed to anymore. We are not covered under errors and missions through as a home inspector if I take off the plate. It's supposed to have a, uh, a master electrician, not just an electrician, a master electrician or the homeowner to remove the plate, right? Because we're not allowed to. We're not insured anymore. That's 16 years ago, right? It changed. But did you get notified that it changed? So now home inspectors are allowed to take the faceplate off for the purposes of inspection. They can't touch anything. They can't fix anything. They can't solve anything. They take the plate off. They take a picture. They put the plate back on. That's all they're, they're allowed to do. But that's been a, you know, a change. 16 years earlier, they weren't allowed to do that. And you talk to realtors and go, did you know that? And they're like, no. Back prior to Tressa, here was the thing, David, if you were, I, I had a listing and you walked in, you know, you and your lovely wife and you came in and you said, I want to buy it. Great. And you wanted at that time to be represented as a client, not a customer, a client. I had to go to my seller and say, hey, listen, I got people that want to buy your place, but they want to have a client relationship with me. You have one already. So I'm already married to you, but I'm asking if I can have a girlfriend. And they would say, yeah, sure, go ahead, have a girlfriend. That would be David and his wife. But now because of my open house, we have, you know, Judy and Brian that also want to buy. So now I got to go to my seller and say, listen, I got another couple, you know, past David and his wife, right? Brian and Judy that want to have a client relationship with me. Well, I'm supposed to ask the seller and then I'm supposed to go to David and his wife and say, hey, guys, somebody else wants to be my girlfriend. Uh, I need your permission to do it before I can offer the service. So you had to say yes or no. And what would it, what benefit would it be? Because you're literally kind of blessing your own competition, David. So would you have done it? Probably not. Right. The reality is, is I'll tell you, the real estate agent didn't even know they were supposed to ask. We don't know how to sell real estate as well as we think we do. No. And I, I, and I do believe that people overcomplicate it. Well, you know, this is one of the reasons why I'm a big fan and a good friend of Brian Madigan, because Brian comes in and goes, guys, listen, there's a bunch of changes and there's a bunch of stuff that you need to be aware of. Like he's the guy that you're going to face in court when you make a mistake and now there's a lawsuit, right? You're either going to get Barry Lebo or you're going to get uh, Brian Madigan as an expert witness for the prosecution against you. And according to them, you start in a hole, 65 things that you didn't do as a professional realtor right. that you should have before they even open the file to find out the problem and why we're here. 65 errors you made as a professional. You know, you're, you're scaring the shit out of a lot of people right now. Yeah, absolutely. You know, why because you on, on, on one hand, it's it's like 
out of jail. Yeah. <laughs> well, on one hand, it's like the education is just almost much in all these changes. Yeah. On the other hand, there's a lot of things you got to do to keep your, your ass safe. 100%. Right? And so many people that have no idea. And truthfully, David, as you can appreciate, right? Uh, as you get into this industry, because it looks like it's easy money, we tell everybody it's easy mm -hmm. money. Mm -hmm. show us make it look like it's easy money. So what happens is once you get in, you kind of go, screw that. I'm going to start cheating. And we have absolutely all kinds of different ethnicities that have reinvented the rules that suit them, right? And the situation is with people like Rico, they could kind of double, triple, quadruple their police force, and they have one. They really do. It's usually filled with ex-cops at this point. And I know for a fact that there's a, an ex-cop, you know, Rico agent that sits stationed. They don't leave anywhere else. They don't live there but they drive there every day in one community specifically because there's so many cases in that municipality at this point that are in contravention in contravention of the RICO Act. Like these are lawsuits that are going to happen and happen and happen because of poorly trained real estate agents. Well, poorly trained is, is the is the key right here. And I believe that the entire thing needs to be revamped. I think that we need to have a complete change as to how people are getting licensed. Um, and if anybody that is in the licensing uh, side of this entire industry wants to know what they are, give me a call. I will share them with you happily. <laughs> you know, just, I, I'm telling you, man, we've got it all wrong. We're, we're, we're making it too simple. You, said, know. You, you, you just said it. People are reinventing the, 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 the rules. People are coming in because it's easy money. Anybody who's actually doing it for a living and doing it well knows it's not easy money. There's a lot of work. There's a lot of responsibilities, a lot of hassles, there's a lot of expenses that need to be made. Yeah. Now, uh, look again, another rabbit hole of a conversation on that one. Fantastic stuff, but I do, I, I'm going to move on. And again, we're talking with Ron James right now, coach uh, about maximizing success and, and how realtors can achieve their full potential. Ron, as we talk about strategies that are working. Yeah. What are you seeing that's working really, you know, consistently well for realtors to build long-term relationships? Okay. Because there's a, a slew of ideas. Yeah. A lot and, of bright, shiny objects. You know, I love, I love watching the memes that kind of go, okay, other than door knocking and cold calling and open houses, how else do I generate business? Uh, door knocking, cold calling, and... <laughs> I'm sorry, the hard work part of this business hasn't... What? Changed. Whoa, 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 whoa. I have to work hard? Yes. Sorry, oh. David. Oh, geez. But but I thought it was just going to be easy. Can I yeah. just pay for leads? Sure. What if yeah. I put on a really nice suit and stand in front of a car that's not mine? Tell you what, give me all your money, I'll give you half back, and at least you'll be halfway ahead. Okay, okay, here. Want to see my watch? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I talk to a, you know, I, usually I start my business planning with clients in August and people kind of go, why August? It's the yeah. end of the year. Like we're way too early. Yeah. I usually like to have five quarters. And the reason why is, and you can appreciate this, David, right? You've done a lot of this work at that point. As we get into the last quarter, that's typically when people take their foot off the gas, right? I worked hard all the way up this year, but you had July and August off. I know, but you know, September was hard on me. So I'm going to slow down pretty much after November. So they cruise to the end of the year. And then, well, you can't start. Nobody wants to buy in January, right? Let's just get through January. We'll start together in February. That's the spring market anyway, right? So they literally take their foot off the gas for a full quarter, right? While they're not working on building the business, et cetera. So I do it. So I build in five quarters. So all of 2025 and the last quarter of 2024. And the reason why is I need you to have a running start into 2025 for you to be effective with your plan. 100%. Otherwise, your plan will actually lose its first quarter, which is its best quarter. And you dismissed it. So, you know, we got to look back at, you know, some of the, again, I'm sorry. One of the things that I guess makes me somewhat different as a coach is I've done this a long time, and I don't tell you that to impress you. Nobody gives a shit that I started March 10th, 1982, 43 years ago, right? Nobody cares. My mom doesn't care. But what I can tell you is I've done, I've seen things, done things, made more mistakes in 43 years than you'll make in your career as a realtor. Here's the cool part. I want to give you the benefit of doing things without the mistakes. At least kind of go, mm, that's going to cost you money. So when I started a business plan with a client at this point, they had 13 deals. That was their year before, 13 deals. 
And I said, so what's your plan for next year? Oh, I'm going to start a, a system. I'm going to buy leads. And I'm like, oh, yeah, what's that going to cost? She said 14 grand, 2000 bucks for the website and $1,000 a month to maintain it. Okay, 14 grand. How much do you expect to kind of generate out of that? Well, at least a deal. The deal wouldn't have even paid for it. Mm -hmm. The amount of money that she would have made net on the dollar at this point in time, she wouldn't. And I'm like, okay, wait a minute. You did 13 deals. Six of them come from this center of influence. And she said, well, it's kind of three and three. And I'm like, what do you mean? She said, I did a barbecue in the summer in August and I generated three leads and then they ricocheted. So the three leads that I put together, sold the properties, helped them buy, helped them sell, it gave me referrals. So I got another three deals as a result of the first three deals. So I'm like, so you got six deals out of a barbecue. And she said, yeah. I said, how much was the barbecue? I was about to say, how much were the hamburgers and hot dogs? Yeah, thousand bucks. Not 14 grand, right? Yeah, thousand bucks. I'm like, <laughs> sorry, I would have another barbecue yeah. for a thousand bucks. Because a thousand bucks is a lot better than a moonshot marketing program. Moonshot basically means I'm going to throw a whole big bunch of money at it. And I have zero expectation of ROI. Like no return on my investment. Right? Guys, you can't afford moonshots. Not in this market. No, no you shot, mean, man. You know, throw the axe and hit it in the bullseye. You have to. It's, it's not a hope. It's not a guess. Right? It has to be a hit, not a miss. Well, look, you just you just said it too. There's six deals out of the one barbecue that was bringing people that you know together, who then talk to you know people they know to reinforce who you are. Right. And this this right here is something that I've seen is as we talk about these strategies that are, are are working well and the consistency of it all. There's not a room I've ever stood in front of, a person I've ever talked to that doesn't agree with me that seventy to ninety percent of the business in this business comes from that group number one, the people that know you like you trust you. Whether it's a direct person in your contact list and or a referral that comes from somebody in that contact list, the bulk of people's business comes from that list. And and they miss the biggest part. They miss they miss the the juiciest fruit of that line that you just said. Here's why. People say I say to them, how many how many people in your database? Oh, I you know I have a thousand. Excellent. If I put a thousand people in the room, how many people would you know and know you by name? Right. About a hundred. Okay. There right. we go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you have a hundred person uh, database. That's going to be good for $25,000 worth of income. It just is. So if you want 250,000, you need legitimately a thousand people that know, love and trust you, right? Not just names, but people that are connected to you in some form or fashion. So people kind of go, holy crap, it took me seven years to get a hundred people. Good. It shouldn't take you another seven years. You know why? Because 100 people already know, love, and trust you, right? And you haven't figured out how to turn them into ambassadors. You haven't led that database. For every one person that's in the database, they can bring you four. They all have a database, a sphere of influence, plus 250 people. Right. They can't send you one more person. If you actually set this up, you could double your database first year and didn't add anybody yourself. They all came because of your current CRM. Do you know how to do that? If you don't, you got to reach out. Well, that, listen, this is a big part of what we talk about with people. I mean, the seven ways to, 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 to communicate. And again, we've got the Ultimate Marketing Bundle, which is available on my website. It's a free download and it teaches everybody who are the two main audiences and what are the seven different ways to communicate with them. And, you know, in, as we look at that and we call one of them in person and you just, you know, talked about the, the door knock, 96% of people in this industry will not door knock. Of the 4% who do, 99% of them say they see business from it. So I say to people all the time, I, I get that you don't like it. I get that you don't want to bother people. You feel like you're, you, you know, you're interrupting somebody. But like, it works. Go out there and do it. And if you could focus on meeting one new person a day, every single day, that's 365 new people a year in your database. On mm -hmm. top of working the database and putting them on a follow-up program and this like we help people build out this whole referral machine. We call it the 10 year plan. It just, it pumps and it, it creates follow-up opportunities. It creates, you know, keep in touch opportunities. It builds a lot of mind share and that mind share does come back to equaling market share. Yeah. Well, everybody's you know, always looking for the bright, shiny object though. I, I see people that kind of go, okay, I'm going to go door knock. And you know, uh, the challenge with this is you're diving into the pool. You have no idea what's in the pool. You don't know if it's deep or, or, or shallow or if it's cold, if it's hot, right? You don't know anything about where it's going. However, do you know what? There really is a strategy. There is methodologies on proper door knocking, right? If I walk into a neighborhood at this point, they kind of said the last sale in this neighborhood was 10 years ago. Guess what? I'm getting the hell out of that neighborhood. You know why? Because the conversion, the turnover in right, that neighborhood is like none. 
right? I need at least a 6%, you know, turnover rate. That means that out of 100 houses last year, six of them actually sold. They changed hands. Is the, is the area that you're knocking on doors, has it had a 6% plus conversion, a turnover rate, right? Do you know that for a fact? Or are you guessing, right? Well, so here's, the thing? Here, like here's I, the thing then. Like, as we talk about the marketing strategy, sorry, I cut you off there. Like, it's just the one thing that circles through my mind, and we talked about this earlier in the show, around folks who are not necessarily leveraging time the right way and therefore don't actually realize what they're accomplishing. And now we're just throwing shit at the wall, hoping something sticks. And we're running around like crazy. And, and, and a, a big thing that we hear often is I'm wearing a lot of hats. I'm spending a lot of money. I don't even know where to get started. What advice are you giving anybody who, who's com feeling, you know, completely burnt out, com feeling completely discouraged? Like we said earlier on in the show, how's are sitting a lot longer on the market? I don't think it's a bad market. Somebody called it a professional's market. I love the line. What would you say to anybody who's feeling burnt out or discouraged right now? I mean, we're seeing a lot of people coming out here. What? Uh, Treb just announced that, uh, you know, they're, they're seeing membership dropping. I came out recently and said, hey, this is a beautiful thing. And I know Treb's like, Dave, how could you say that? And look, I I'm not saying like, you know, what I am saying is there are a lot of people that shouldn't be in this business. So the fact that they're dropping out ain't bad. For those that want to take it seriously, what do you tell them? Yeah. About well, there's a lot of people at this point in time that have left organized real estate uh, because of its leadership, not just, early, just because they, they don't get it, they don't like it, or they can't hack it. There's a bunch of people at this point in time that want to make a stand at this point that say, right, this was bullshit. You guys took advantage of your own membership at this point in time. You should be ashamed of yourselves. However, I can say that you can't. Yeah, but you know, I'm going to say something too, okay? Because I, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, this, this stems from, again, what transpired a few years ago when the government took advantage of everybody as well, okay? And again, well, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole today because it is a rabbit hole, but I am going to say that that has changed the mentality of the way people believe. I've lost faith in the government. I've lost faith in the education system. I've lost faith in the legal system. I've lost faith in the healthcare system. We've lost faith. And, and to what you just said around yeah. the industry, there's been some big changes too. And is it people going, well, we can just do the wave will pass. The, the smoke will clear and everybody will kind of forget that we did it. Cause there's so much more coming down the pipe that they got to deal with anyway. So how much time can they spend on worrying about this? Yeah. Uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, the, the, the lack of leadership, the lack of, of, uh, you know, brokerage responsibility. I know some amazing brokers and God love them. Right. They really kind of care about the people that work in their brokerage companies mm -hmm. and they do their best at this point in time to provide training, bring people like you in, David, um, to, you know, educate them and try to motivate their people at this point. But as they say, you can drag a horse to water, you can't make them drink. That's so they right. bring you who's an expert and you're going to really help them change their business, their core business. Right. And the guy's apologizing to you as you get there because you're going to be talking to three of his 35 agents. Right. It's a situation where even the agents themselves don't have that thirst to kind of have a drive to learn to be better. They already think they got a ticket. They got a license. What more do they need to know? Right. Just because you have a license doesn't mean you know how to drive the car. Fair. Right? Fair. So, is it, so, so, so what are you saying to that then? Go continue to educate yourself. Go continue to learn. Yeah. You know, and I'll tell you something. So I talked to a good friend of mine who's probably one of the most educated realtors that I know, plus a hundred thousand dollars in their own personal education in the craft right? He is my go-to, this particular one agent, my go-to for anybody divorcing. He's, he is the guru. Okay. He's okay, the cool. And he's also my seniors expert. I'm good. He's great at this point. And he said, you know what? I'm a hundred thousand, you know, dollars plus in my own education and edification of my craft. I take it so seriously. Right. And yet I can walk in into a competition and somebody who's going to do it for a nickel gets the listing. It's not about service. It's about price. And now, you know, it's, he's making a point that, you know, it's how low, low will you go? That's who's going to win. We're not at the pioneer gas station level yet. There's still people who buy from Shell and Esso mm -hmm. and Petrocan, right? We don't have to go to the discount uh, gas companies or the discount realty companies as a mainstay. They take a piece of the market share. They're not the entire market share. So what happens is, right, I said to him, you have way more value than the agent who's coming in doing it for a nickel. 
right? Have you reviewed your value proposition? You are worth every penny. You're worth more than most agents. And, you know, he said, yeah, you know, I needed to be reminded that, yeah, my $100,000 education means something. I can deliver a higher level of value to the client. Then it's not about price. It's about value, right? They're going to want it done. They're going to want it done in an expedited way. They're going to want it at the high level. They're also going to want to be able to kind of handle working with an agent that knows what to do if the property's still in the market in 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, 180 days. There's just not enough footprints in the snow, David, that we can look around at this point and kind of go, who knows somebody that's had a listing that look, took longer than 60 days to sell? Look around. No hands go up. All of the well, old guys like me well, that are used to it at this point aren't putting our hands up anymore. This is our time, right? It's true. Look, there's a lot of opportunity ahead. Yeah. I do believe that, again, and I said earlier in the show, communicate to educate. We talked about the database being the gold mine, as it always is and always has been, and I do believe always will be. Work the database, communicate with people, leverage the different channels you can to be in front of people. Again, build the mind share. The more we're doing that and we're speaking with people, the more we're developing a stronger relationship with people, they will be more open to coming to us and not as concerned around price point, more willing to pay what we are worth because of what we bring to the table because they know what the final outcome will be. And again, a lot of that comes back to work in the relationships that you have. So, you know, Ron, as we, as, as we do look ahead now, I just mentioned about optimism. I do believe there's a lot of opportunity ahead. What are you, what are you seeing maybe, you know, what's ahead for our industry maybe? And I'm going to give two fronts right now. You know, one is kind of that expanded five to 10 year. Where's the industry kind of going just in your mind? Okay. And, and, and that takes into consideration again, all the things that work. It takes into consideration all the bright, shiny objects that come to people. Um, and then I'm going to take the five to 10 year and can seriously condense it into the next 12 to 18 months. And I do that specifically because of the fact that we're seeing a lot of mortgages come up for renewal. Right. I, I, I do want to say to everybody again, and you said five quarters in a year. You said starting in August. My message very much to everybody has been get out there and talk to people now because in the next 6, 12, 18 months when they need to get out of their property, some of them because they bought houses that were way overpriced with money they didn't have and they realize they can't afford to do it. Unfortunately, they're going to need to move. As long as you position yourself properly sort of here, you will be ready when they are there. Yeah. What's your kind of outlook on where we're going? Absolutely. So I'll just talk to that first before I look at the long range on that situation. Yep. So the immediate situation is how many people here really understand the power sale process, right? There's a whole, that's a whole tin of- It comes back to your education, people. fair. Yep. They haven't got a clue, right? Uh, and, and what's changed? I mean, Gowling's uh, at this point in time, they set the kind of gold standard as to how the real estate will be sold, but realtors have no idea. I mean, I used to teach right? Teaching how to sell power sales. I did it in conjunction, right? With national trust, right? We went <laughs> across the country and educated certified realtors on how to handle and dispose of, right? Uh, power sale properties. And, you know, I'm saying this, they're not foreclosures. If you're in the Ontario market, for example, at this point, we don't have foreclosure, we have power sale. But if you're in BC, it's a foreclosure strategy and it's a little different. People don't even know the difference between A or B. Right, let alone how to sell them. And then because it was such it was such a big thing once upon a time in the mid 80s when I started, I mean, CMHC was its own real estate company. They had hundreds, pardon me, thousands of listings that they were in control of. CMHC was its own brokerage. Right. They paid realtors mm -hmm. a five percent commission if you brought them an offer. They just sat and took in offers and paid the realtor five percent for doing it. It was the way that I made a lot of money in my very young and very novice career at this point. Fast forward, you know, any kind of power of sale is bad news, bad publicity. It's like, you know, I had a bad hamburger at Joe's. Now social media knows that Joe's sucks. So as we start to kind of go into a situation where they're going to run into problems, the banks are scrambling as they are right now to kind of go, can we extend the amortization? Can we have a skip a payment program? Can we tack a payment on the back end? The banks are doing everything in their power to save these people so there's no publicity about the power sale strategy, right? But at some point, it's going to reach an economic life where they have no choice but to go power sale. 
Mm-hmm. Are you ready? Do you know what the power sale situation is like? Do you know what it's like when you buy one? I've had people show up on the day of closing six o'clock with a truck full of stuff and the client redeemed. What? The DOR, right? What's the hat? Right. Mm-hmm. They are allowed to write of redemption on this situation, the ROR, the right of redemption on what's actually happening. It means that the client that sold the house didn't have to, they made good with the bank. But I have a buyer, we have a contract, they have a truck full of stuff. Tough. I wasn't aware. I'm going to sue everybody. I'm going to call Rico. Tough. You didn't do the homework. You didn't know the process. And now you're on the shit end of the stick and your client thinks you're a loser because you didn't know. Right. You, you so this comes right know. back to education then. Yeah, hundred percent. But again, like you know, I'm an old guy. I've done this for a really, really long time. I'm a valuable resource, guys. Like if you're young and a hotshot and you're all AI, good, cool. But I'll tell you something: you still need what I know. I got to say, not cool. Don't don't get caught up in the bright shiny object, Ron. I got in this business. I've been playing in the sand. I, I look. I've been playing in the sandbox for forty years. Was that? They think we're the dinosaurs. But here's the thing, though. I've been playing in the sandbox for 40 years, okay? 20 years growing up in it. My dad owned a brokerage. I I was babysat, let's say, behind the front desk. And no, not babysat for 20 years, but just put in perspective. I was around that that industry. You know, as I got into it professionally, for the past 20 years, we've watched this, this, again, roller coaster of ideas come out. My man, you could tell me longer than I could tell you, just as you've already acknowledged you've been doing it longer than I have, per se. Back then, people talked to people. They had quarters in their pocket. They ended up getting pagers. They ended up getting, you know, big ass bags with cell phones. And the cell phone got really smart and got, you know, attached to a car with a curly Q antenna, you know, and then it became a brick that you carried around that you couldn't put in the pocket to all of a sudden these stupid phones, which some people for some reason call smartphones, which another, you know, rabbit hole here. Point is, we still sit here in 2024 saying it's a people business. So if you can educate yourself and you can have enough knowledge to educate others and you can do enough to connect and build the relationships with people, you should be able to survive. And taking a page out of the old school book around people business and taking a page out of the new school book about how to leverage some of the technology to help you build more mindshare, just get out there in front of more people, connect with more individuals, create more opportunity. That's all good. But we yeah. cannot go away from the hey, I'm going to change. I'm going to chase bright shiny objects. Not educate myself. Not put in the hard work because you will not survive in this business. Yeah, and you won't maximize the success. There's there's a lot of uh, effort. So you know, we talked about uh, door knocking, right? There's a proper way. There's a right and a wrong way to door knock. And the results are you're going to continue to hear people kind of going, "I did it. It was hard. I didn't get anything, so I stopped doing it." Yeah. Well, we talk to the people who continue to do it. They always see business. Right. Well, it's the same thing, whether, you know, if it's door knocking, if it's circle prospecting, if it's, you know, pick your neighbor nights, if it's an open house. Right. It's interesting. You know, when the when COVID was around and the open houses stopped and people were like, oh, thank God. Finally, geez, I never liked open houses. They never produced anything for me, et cetera. I was the only one going, hooray, all of my competition, all the people who are, you know, getting into a listing presentation That's when right. they say do open houses. No, we don't do that. We don't believe in them. Great. Ron James does for the longest right. time. I, my my uh, email address was Ron James at I love open houses.com. <laughs> was it really? I actually had it written on my clothes, on my sweaters, on my shirts, on my t shirts. It said, I love open houses. I remember a real estate agent tapping me on the shoulder, going, I friggin' hate open houses. And I went, and the reason why is because more for me. Yeah, but, but you know what, man? I'll tell you, I hear tons of success stories even as of today. From open houses. Good point. How old is an open house? It's like since the time began, and people kind of go, "Well, how do I do it without? How do I just AI that?" Well, you know what? What AI can't do is hard work on the street, belly to belly with a contact, and like, keep you relevant in this industry uh, for longevity. Be it twelve to eighteen months, five to ten years, or longer. Yeah, I'm not a. I'm not anti AI. It has a place. It has. I'm a, with you. The tools. However, there are some things in our business that you have to be, you have That's to be right. better at. That's you right. have to learn. You have to have language and skills. And to answer your question, when somebody says, how's the market? I go back to the absolute guru, right? Tom Hopkins. He says this, how's the market? He answers every single time. Unbelievable. Because it's unbelievably shit or unbelievably great. <laughs> I love it. Unbelievable is your answer. 
What's that word? Ron, we have uh, we spent a lot of time today talking about maximizing success. Um, we've talked about trends. We've talked about insights. We've talked about what's transpired. We've talked about where we're going. We've given, you know, some really good tips. And I think that if I boil some of this down, it's, it's you know, education. It's, it's sticking with the hard work. It's doing the things that, you know, you potentially don't want to, but you know that you should be, um, you know, and, and it's it's a great reinforcement for people to help them have success. Now, as we speak about success, and we even talked about what to do when you got burnout, mm -hmm. I'm curious to know, just as we, as we sort of wrap up here, as you yourself are out there every single day doing what you do and helping this industry be a better place, helping people within the industry be more successful for themselves, how do you know, Ron James, it's been a successful day for you when you're done your day? Well, that's a great question, David. Uh, so here's the situation. I say this a lot to all of my charges and any of the clients that I actively have or have had in the past. I always say this. I don't want to be right, but I really want you to be rich. So this is a situation. If you take something that I've shared with you and you figured out whether you need to change its color, apply it, you know, male or female or whatever, but you've used a piece of advice that we've spoken about and it has success. And I'll tell you the story. I, I had said to a woman about, you know, she was kind of talking about not having business. I'm like, do you have old leads? Yes, I have old leads at this point, but I'm not going to call them. I'm like, here's what you're going to do for an old lead. I want you to just say this, still interested in real estate, question mark, send. And she's like, I'd never send that. And I'm like, just that, not a big warm up, not how you doing, or not, you know, have you started your, you know, Thanksgiving shopping at this point? None of that. Just, right, still interested in real estate, question mark, send. And she's arguing with me. And I'm like, what if I'm right? What if what I've said? So what she does, and I don't know this, she sends this to a client that put in an offer, didn't get it. They haven't spoken in 10 months, et cetera. So by the time we're finishing arguing, she starts going, ah, ah. And I'm like, what? Did you stub your toe? She said, I just sent that to the woman from 10 months ago and we're going out on Saturday. <laughs> I don't want to be right, but I really want you to be rich. So shut up. You don't know everything you think you know. Christ, I'm not, I'm on your side. You pay me to be at your freaking table. Why would I lie to you? Let me help you be you. There it is. You. There it is. That four word letter word again, ladies and gentlemen, the word help. And now to all of my loyal listeners, first of all, you know, I'm grateful for you. And I thank you to anybody that's brand new to the show today. Uh, we're talking with Ron James about maximizing success. And, and I asked that question at the end of every single show, Ron, um, how do you know it's been a successful day for you? And, and I will tell you, everybody uses the word help. Nobody uses the word money. Yeah. Not about how much money we made. It's about how we were able to help others. Yeah. So thank you for keeping us batting a thousand over here. My man, any final words of wisdom that you want to share above and beyond everything you've shared with everybody today uh, just before we take off? You know what? Uh, uh, if you enjoyed listening to your grandfather tell stories of the family from back in the day <laughs> at this point in time, go find a grandfather or grandmother in real estate and listen to what they said of the old days. Take them for lunch. Go take them for coffee at this point. I'll tell you, old is new again. Right. There's talking of, I mean, we talk about people that don't know how to sell a conditional upon sale of purchasers property. Well, guess what, guys? There's a right way, a proper way and an improper way of doing that. When I started in real estate, the first eight years I was in real estate, every single one of our deals was subject to the sale of the purchaser's property. It, it was the commonplace. It was the norm, not the exception. Now I talk to people, they're like, oh, my seller doesn't want to do that. You know, you know. Again, fear and education. So guys, please go find yourself some tired old real estate agent in the back of the office at this point. Squeeze them for information. They've got some really good ideas that you could use today. Great. I love the way you finished that off. Old is new again. That has been a running theme throughout my mind and a lot of what we've been talking about over the past number of days, weeks, even months lately. Um, and I do th really think that everybody should seriously internalize what was just shared there. Go find that person. Well, I, look at I, what's I, working. Look at what has worked. Look at what continues to work. A shout out to Barry Lebo. Uh, when, when we went into COVID and nobody had a clue what, you know, whether we were going to be an essential service or whatever the case is. So I saw something that Barry kind of said, 
that really resonated with me. He said, there's no footprints in the snow. There was no direction forward. We didn't know where to go. We had no compass bearing. So guys, at a time, if you're in a marketplace right now or you're stuck, right, and you have no compass bearing, right, go find somebody who's put footprints in the snow, somebody who's done it before, somebody who's walked that trail who can give you, hey, it might have changed. It's a little different than it was 25 years ago, but this might be a place to start. And that's all you need. You just need that place to start. Pick the wallpaper and big chunks, and this will start to kind of appear to you as to what you need to do to change the pivot of your business in the right direction. Ron James, everybody. Mr. James, a huge thank you for making the time today to join us on the Mindshare podcast. Love the insights. Love the conversation. As you know, you and I, um, this could probably go on for for sort of a marathon of a few days if we kept talking. So, <laughs> you know how our conversations go offline. Uh, but seriously, my man, thank you very, very much for sharing with us today. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me on. It really isn't the Joe Rogan show. I got all emotional and started screaming. <laughs> We'll do it again shortly, pal. Thank you. Thank you. You are either watching this on one of your favorite podcast platforms or listening to it on one of your favorite podcast platforms. Maybe you're watching us live. Uh, maybe you went to my website, mindshare101.com. Uh, while you're there, of course, as I always say, please be sure to learn more about our one-to-one -one coaching. We have some fantastic programs going on. Uh, our group training, which is absolutely powerful. And of course, our keynote speaking. Um, download your free copy of the Ultimate Marketing Bundle. Ron and I just chatted about uh, the various different ways to communicate with people. What's old is new again be sure to check that out again the ultimate marketing bundle it's a free download i want you all to have it use it as a reference every single time you're trying to think about your communication strategy what you're going to do to grow your business and how you're going to become a better agent for all inquiries of course just get in touch with our team and do that today don't forget to leave a review of this podcast. We make that super simple for you. Uh, you go to www.ratethispodcast.com forward slash Mindshare 101. Of course, if you're on iTunes, uh, go directly to iTunes, find the Mindshare podcast. Big five stars. Tell us how much you love the show. Uh, if you're on Spotify or anything else, we would love that, uh, that you go ahead and uh, give us a quick rating. It means a lot to us. Uh, of course, please, if we haven't yet, connect with me on Facebook and TikTok at Mindshare101 and on Instagram at David Greenspan 101 Just before we take off, I want and need to say a big thank you to Kits Keep In Touch Systems, REM Magazine, and the ORCF, the Ontario Realtors Care Foundation, for being our sponsors today. This has been another episode of the Mindshare Podcast. Thank you for tuning in.